And now we start for real. Good evening, everyone. Whoop. That's better. Welcome to Absurd. My name is Isolde, and I will be leading you through tonight's whimsical oddities, strange science, questionable art, and ludicrous decisions. I will be your guide as we try to decipher what even is happening. Welcome. I would like to ask before we get started, who here is new? Who, who are the first timers? Oh, excellent, a lot of you, welcome. Thank you for coming. So some of you may be wondering, how does this thing work? <laughs> what is going on? At Otsalon, we are a community of enthusiastic weirdos and history nerds that are both experts and amateurs that share strange stories of history, art, science, and adventure. This stage is your stage. We like to hear new voices up here all the time. So, if, ooh, Lost my image. Bam. Uh, it is a participatory project. So if you have really good ideas for upcoming salons, please go to oddsalon.com backslash speak and submit your pitches for upcoming salons. Uh, mystery in the third week of October is open for pitches. Ooh. Or is it? <laughs> Also, uh, you do not have to put your phone away. You can please tweet and gram and share. Uh, another way you can participate is uh, share your reactions as they happen live at the show. Also, you can join us at Something Weird where we continue the weird conversation and uh, post interesting articles and cute animals and weird animals, etc. No, really, pitch. Now, Speaking of hearing new voices, this is not a quiet lecture series. As one of our fellows said, we are drinkers with a speaking problem. <laughs> so you can also participate and show your enthusiasm to our speakers with a variety of callbacks. To get us started, we are going to practice a few fan favorites, like... Monday. You guys are awesome. And... And, Water. ooh, I was just gonna be like, absurd, WTF, I don't know. But back to absurd. We are all here to learn something weird tonight, to examine what is bizarre, what is different, what challenges our worldview, or is perhaps illogical in some way. To begin, I'd like you to consider curiosity and experience something or seeing something for the first time and imagine back to the age of menageries, this age where powerful people would procure wondrous and strange beasts for display to, to enjoy. So in 1515, a unique exotic beast was to be transported from India as a diplomatic gift to Portugal. There was much anticipation for this near mythical type of animal because this animal had been familiar to Romans but had not been seen in Europe for 13 centuries. Its name was Jenda. The animal traveled from, from India to Lisbon via ship, where at port it drew thousands of spectators and the interest of scholars who wanted to study it immediately. It's true. After a few weeks, this wonderful animal, was, it was decided to be sent as a gift to uh, Pope Leo X. But there was an unexpected squall and the ship sank. Wah, wah. That was the end of Genda, the first Renaissance rhinoceros. However, brief, though his tenure may have been in Lisbon, a description of the animal and a crude sketch had made it to Albrecht Dürer. Based on other people's descriptions and a description based on Pliny the Elder's description and a very crude cartoon that someone else had drawn, uh, Durer made a study and a woodcut of this fantastic animal that he, had ne that he himself had never seen. Behold, the Durer rhinoceros. So good. Science and art. Now, 
you rhinoceros and art critics might be thinking, Pfft, what is up with this? It is preposterous. Segmented armor? It has a plated gorget on its throat, a sawtooth, car sawtooth carapace on its butt, scaly feet, and a tiny dorsal horn. So cute. Scoff, you might. You might think, how did, this how did this man manage to capture a likeness of an animal that he's never seen? He got it completely wrong. Whoa, okay, maybe not. Oh. Let's do that again, just for funsies. Huh? Never seen it. He really got a lot right. Though there were colorful inaccuracies, he really did capture an amazing likeness of this animal. Now, 60 years later, there was a second rhinoceros brought to the European Renaissance, a bada. Now, uh, she lived for, I think, 15 to 20 years in captivity and was studied and depicted by various artists. And as you can note, she does not have the pommel spike because rhinoceroses do not have a pommel spike. And as a delightful aside, because we are talking about absurd, and I want to share one absurd anecdote about Abada. When she was in the custody of King Philip II of Spain, he decided to prank the Hieronymite friars in his city by releasing the large angry Abada into their dormitory at dawn. <laughs> totally good, harmless fun. Anyway, surprisingly, even though there was a new rhinoceros specimen, Durer's idea of a rhinoceros gained far more traction and continued to be reproduced by Western representations of the rhinoceros, even though people knew that the anatomical features were incorrect. We see Durer's rhino again, and again, and again. And even, even uh, contemporary artists are, are capturing this adorable dorsal horn, which is now known as Durer's horn. And so his vision of the rhinoceros captivated and charmed, making Genda the most famous rhinoceros in the world. Now, also by Salvador Dali. I would be remiss tonight if I did not touch on absurdist philosophy. And the absurdity comes from this idea that we humans inherently strive to find meaning in the chaos of a hostile and meaningless universe. That disconnect is absurd. This idea of seeking meaning where there is none, that is, that is absurdism. Now, I'm gonna take you another step further into a, a small genre of theater, theater called the theater of the absurd. Yeah. Oh, some fans. Stoppard. Uh, this is a post-war collection of plays that embrace the philosophies of absurdism and analyze what happens when human communication breaks down. I would like to end, <laughs> I will end my absurd analysis of rhinoceros representation in Western art with Eugene Ionesco's absurdist play, Rhinoceros. See, see what I did there? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Very clever indeed. In this play, the main character, Beringer, is a shiftless drunk, an everyman, so, you know, totally relatable. And he must adapt as the people in his town began to transform into violent green rhinoceroses. <laughs> in the second act, various characters try to out-rhetoric rhinoceritis, trying to stop the rhinoceroses by forbidding them, which does not work. And the characters argue that they themselves will never, never become rhinoceroses because they've declared that they won't, and yet they undergo a metamorphosis into a green rhinoceros anyway. Now, in the play, the metamorphosis of people into rhinoceroses is a metaphor and criticism by Ionesco against mob mentality and the dangers of conformity and blind nationalism. Simply, rhinoceritis is an allegory for the rise of fascism and the shocking expansion of, Nazi, of the Nazi party before World War II. And uh, this is Ionesco's suggestion that it is not that humans are inherently evil, but it is when people do not stop and question, do not critically think, that dangers arise. Now, in Act Three, 
Berenger, our shiftless drunk, he too undergoes a transformation. He goes from indifference in the first act to, in the third act, declaring himself the champion and protector of humankind, absurdly, when he is the only human left and everyone else has become a herd of rhinoceroses. And also, at the end of the play, there's this uncertainty whether or not he himself will also turn into a rhinoceros. We're unsure. So what does it all mean? Philosophically, Ionesco gives us two takeaways from this play. That first, you need purpose to find meaning in life. So Beringer finds his purpose, which is to defend humans. But is it meaningless if he himself becomes a rhinoceros? And number two, to find meaning, you have to realize that the world is absurd, and then you can find meaning. How do we embrace meaningless to find meaning? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's this. My name is Isolde Honoré. An anagram of this is Lucid Rhino. <laughs> and so, I will share for tonight's invocation a poem I have composed. Alack, a lucid rhino, his pace is sure and quick. If faith I do not know, where he his snout may stick. The mighty beast doth rage against some perceived scorn, but one cannot reason with an argument of horn. If pursued by rhino, my sage advice to thee is get thee hence and safely up yon nearest tree. To the absurd, to nonconformity, and to finding joy when you can. Tonight, please welcome Leonard Appelton. Excuse me. Woo, this is delicious. <coughs> Rebecca Pellicini, Barbara North, Aaron Doran, and first time speaker Lynn Lawn. And starting us out tonight, Brianne Hughes with. White and nerdy 100 years of American novelty music. <laughs> 